Well, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and welcome everybody. Uh, also, if you're uh, watching this a little later and uh, not in the live stream, welcome to you as well. Um, I've been asked to give a little bit of a Christmassy themed lecture. So this is going to be slightly different to what I normally do. And you'll see that we're starting off with something um, quite Christmassy and robotic -y at the same time. I called this center's little helper. Um, robots picking, packing, delivering. You'll see I'm going to go straight quite far away and my interpretation is probably relatively loose of what sort of Santa's jobs may be. Uh, but we're going to strike into a number of the robotics tasks that we do at the University of Lincoln, where we're trying to build robots that can actually make a difference in the real world. Um, so yeah, my name is Mark Anaida. I'm a professor of intelligent robotics and interactive systems, and I am the director of the Center for Autonomous Systems and also the um, EPSSC Center for Doctoral Training Agri Forwards. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our, our center as we are. So you have um, quite a large group from different schools in Lincoln that work together to advance robotics research. And you see a lot of my little faces here from the different colleagues on the right hand side um, and the sort of specialist areas that they are working on. Um, and on the left hand side, you see the main domains, the main applications that we are interested in, where we try to deploy robotics technology into. And I've circled two because in my talk today, I'm only going to uh, scratch the surface, let's say, on two of those applications domains. Um, first, we're going to talk about nuclear robotics. Now, how is, can we make that Christmassy? I'll try to show a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to move on to agri food. Um, and you will hopefully see some of the commonalities and the challenges that are shared between the different application domains and even the job of Santa. So I'm going to try to make some references back and forth. Um, the group is a super cross-disciplinary of people from the School of Engineering. We've got people from the Lincoln Institute for Agri-Food Technology and students also from our MSc and PhD programs. And you see like the, the picture at the bottom is from our uh, last bigger away day where we really get all good old people together. Um, talking about getting people together, this is what I'm presenting here. Very few of that, very little of that is actually my own work. Um, my role as a director of that center is to give exposure to my colleagues. And we just had a fantastic end of year party this year, uh, where you see the, 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 the breast, the diversity of this team, also in the foods that we had. So I just thought I have to make this shout out, particularly also to the organization team of this fantastic event that we had in our lovely Isaac Newton building uh, just a couple of days ago. So we have a quite a broad spectrum of different projects and different collaborators and different funders. So one of the key bits to do robotics research is that you have to get some money to actually pay people to do this sort of research. So we are working a lot with industry partners. We're working a lot with the research councils, um, the engineering and physical sciences research council that also fund the Agri Forwards CDT, so it's the Center for Doctor Training. Uh, we've been part of the National Center for Nuclear Robotics. That's something I'm going to make some reference to. And we also got a number of European projects that we're collaborating with people all across Europe, namely Iliad, uh, Darko, and, and Bacos, to just name a few. So um, now comes my Christmassy theme. And this is uh, a video that we shot at the Christmas party, uh, what is now seven years ago. And it was a sort of little hobby project of one of our PhD students at the time where we got this robot. It's a Baxter robot by Rethink Robotics, which is a standard platform that can be used in manufacturing and to do typically packing tasks and so picking things up and dropping them somewhere else. And uh, he made a quite simple, nice demonstrator from this to put little parcels in a big box. Now, it's not quite exactly Santa's job, but it was a sort of first uh, manipulation system. And you could, the good thing is what was impressive for us is that you could build these type of systems pretty quickly these days by using uh, existing software components and put them together through something that we call ROS, the robot operating system, which is a really widespread use um, middleware that allows people to plug different robotics components together to make an application to actually sort something out. Um, and then research is all about trying to make the different 
bits and pieces of this overall system better, right? So trying to advance the technology in each of them, and then to put it into application domains, we need to put these different technologies that we have advanced through our research into an integrated system that solves certain tasks, like this very simple one here. Now, if we are to decompose this very simple task, what is this robot doing? What are the main building blocks of it? So let's have a quick look at that. First of all, the robot must be able to see what and where it needs to pick. So if you see, if you look at this particular setup here, you'll find little circles on those parcels. So because this is a simple system that somebody put together in a very short period of time, we just put some so-called fiducial markers on top of them. Um, and then there's a camera here on the left hand side. You can just about make out the uh, the tripod there on the left hand side that looks at these objects, can detect these circles because it knows what size these circles have and what sort of perturbation they have in the image. It can figure out the position of them and also the orientation of them. So it's not actually even the robot looking here. It's got nice little eyes. We call, by the way, we call this robot Zoidbot. For those who know Futurama, we'll probably get the reference here. Um, and we use this camera to detect these objects. So that's the, a very simple solution. Um, if you go out into real world domains, it's very unlikely you can put uh, stickers on all the objects you may ever want to handle. And also they are probably not all of the same size and same weight and same properties. But the problem of seeing what and where to pick is one of the big problems that needs to be advanced. And there's been a lot of advancements in computer vision recently or for quite a while already with the sort of deep learning methods, convolutional neural networks, et cetera, to make a more general approach to identify the pose and the, uh, and the, the type of an object that we've got in there. So once we've got that, it's the question where to place this. This is uh, in this system, again, super simple, right? For our little Santa Salpa here, we just have predefined where exactly that object needs to be dropped off. Super simple. If you've got something where you are picking something in, uh, let's say, at the North Pole, and you want to deliver it and drop it off uh, in a living room after you've traveled down the chimney, the problem becomes much harder to find out where exactly you go and then exactly how you get there. Um, one thing I've kind of moved over very quickly is how we can handle it securely. How can we grasp it? Again, here we have got very simple manipulator, just these two finger grippers, and they close until you've got a fixed force and that hopefully holds the object tightly. If you want to handle uh, delicate objects, and we'll later on see things like strawberries, for instance, or sort of any other soft fruit, um, this sort of pinching grip is obviously not the right grasp. And for different applications, you have all sorts of different manipulators um, and how you can actually identify what is the right way to grasp in them is another interesting research area. Um, finally, once we have where we need to be, how we can get hold of it, we need to identify how we get to where we want to put it, right? And that is usually called trajectory planning. So we're trying to find a way to get us from A to B. Getting us from A to B is quite simple. In this case, this is a fixed robot. It's not moving. So we just have to do something called inverse kinematics. So we need to find from the position where we are to the goal destination and translate these coordinates in the world into the positions of our joints and basically plan in this joint space to make sure that we actually reach that destination. And these are all different aspects in robotics. And if you are a student of uh, undergrad students, we have master students of robotics. These are all things that you uh, will all probably have heard of before. But each of them actually are interesting uh, research areas that people look into within our research center. Good. So that was the general sort of gist on um, on Santa's little helper that we made about seven years ago. And I'll come back to that a little later. And I'm going to pick these different four components and talk about them a little more in detail. Now we now we're moving down from the from the North Pole that you see here, um, that actually is what Google told me is, a, is a, a photograph of the North Pole on the bottom left. And we're moving into an area that is uh, an aerial view of Stellar Field. What is Stellar Field? Stellar Field is uh, the UK's biggest nuclear site. That's where in the um, 1950s, late 40s, early 50s, 
uh, the British government also did a lot of the research that led to the development of the British nuclear weapons. And also it was the site of the first nuclear reactor in the world that was commercially operating. As you see, it's an old site. And the problem is that because it is such an old site, it carries a lot of legacy. And you may have heard in news uh, that indeed there is quite a few safety issues around that because of the very old facility here. And there's a big, big long term plan. Uh, I think it's about a hundred year plan to eventually turn this site back into green fields. So big decommissioning effort that is going on in Sellafield up in Cumbria, quite far away from Lincoln. I can tell you it's quite a long journey to get there. Um, but it is, I believe, the biggest nuclear site uh, in Europe and uh, there's uh, lots of interesting challenges in there, particularly around safety, because on the top right, I've given you an indication of uh, this is taken from a Guardian article, so this is nothing secret. This is the uh, one of sort of typical working environments for humans in there, because what it means taking this decommissioning this entire site is that all of the nuclear waste needs to be well, a lot of the nuclear waste or a lot of the uh, legacy uh, facilities in there need to be sorted and segregated into different categories. So, of course, we want to minimize the overall amount of nuclear waste. And as such, there's a lot of people working in these so-called glove boxes where they take a heap of material, and that could be rubber material, could be metal, could be all sorts of things that are uh, that came out from the uh, decommissioning process. They need to be classified, categorized, and then segregate into different boxes. So basically, it's the same as Santa's task that you've seen at the beginning. We've got objects, we need to pick them, and we must actually put them in the right box, not just in one box. We want to sort and segregate in this environment. And why is this important? Obviously, if you have got humans working in such an environment here, it's very risky, in particular, if they are, you know, they're working through these gloves and if there is any sort of, um, damage small piece in the the material uh, they can be exposed to radioactive uh, material and be contaminated themselves so what the ambition is overall is to remove humans from these very hazardous processes not just these in general when we look in the nuclear uh, domain we want to remove people from these hazards as far as possible uh, so well this is, looks quite still kind of not too uh, risky environment, there I can tell you there's some where the risk is significantly higher. So we want to get rid of humans in this particular setting and replace them with robots. So here's another example. Uh, and indeed, as I said, the idea is pretty much the same. We have these robotic arms. It's all about finding out what we need to pick, how we can grasp it without slipping it, how can we remove can be moved safely to another place safely in particular because we mustn't collide in particular with the container and everything so safety is a key part in these the settings and then where do we want to place it now the big difference between these nuclear settings and what we'll later on talk about uh, some strawberry picking operations for instance is that of course here the situations are always very unique each situation is different <coughs> each box would be different to another one. So we are, ex we are experiencing a lot of variation between the different tasks. You know, you open a can, you pour it out into this box, you've got a heap of objects, and you didn't quite know what to expect. And here is where still human experience is super important to come in. We cannot yet expect robots to do this in the most generic way, because they don't know exactly what they want to do. So we really want to have humans in the loop. <laughs> and this leads to a concept that has been explored in particular also in this domain for quite a while named shared control. So this is about humans and robots working together. Um, the simplest form is just a teleoperation system. And we've been playing around with some teleoperation systems for quite a while here. On the right hand side, you see one, for instance, that is this on the left, <coughs> the robot on the left is being used as the so-called leader robot. A human operator is operating it is moving it about and then the task is solved on the robot on the right hand side um, 
that allows them to be very, very spatially apart. So you could actually do this, and we've got some trials where we've done this over very long distances. <coughs> Sorry, with one robot operating in London, being the one that is the leader, and then have one of the robots in our lab in Lincoln that is the follower. This is quite close to also what um, medical robotics are doing with telesurgery. So you may have a surgeon in one place, and they're actually operating a patient that is quite far, far away. So with shared control, it's not just a one-to-one -one direct mapping of how one set moves to the other. The concept is that parts of it, that the user is assisted um, in the movement of this so-called follower robot. And we can assist them, through instance, through something like uh, force guidance. So we can create artificial forces that feel like you're actually hitting an obstacle where you're not. So while you're moving your, your leader robot around, you may encounter that actually you, you feel there's a bit of a you know force feedback. And some people know this probably even from force feedback joysticks. Or if you have uh, a car that has a, a lane assistance system, then you can also feel when you are about to leave the lane, you can feel that in the steering wheel. And the same here, right? we can give this sort of force guidance back to operators um, and therefore reduce their cognitive load. And we can do this by actually understanding the environment that they are working in and then reduce, for instance, the risk that they are colliding with something. So you, before you're actually even colliding, you're feeling a force that pulls you away from this potentially hazardous situation. And this is, again, for uh, in order to do that in robotics, we need to have a model of our world that you see somewhere here. We can plan trajectories autonomously, so we can decide we want to go from A to B, and we've heard this about trajectory planning before. And with the concept of shared control, we do not just execute that trajectory, we're using it to guide people along the way. Um, some other bits up here is just to kind of also show that there's many, many different manipulators. On the left-hand side, you see a, a robotic hand that is resembling a human one, for which you need to actually plan different grasps. So how are you approaching this object? And very different to just this pinch gripper that you see on the right hand side. And last but not least, I'm just going to play this one at the bottom again. The interesting bit is I've talked about, you know, in the in the initial video that I've shown you with our little Santa's helper, you had these objects nicely spaced out. They were not occluding each other. They were not on top of each other. Um, and that one is, of course, quite easy to see then which objects you may want to grasp next. In reality, you may have a heap of all sorts of different objects. And so we're doing here some work to identify a way to um, move objects about first to separate them out so we can actually better see them. You've seen this just now, right? So just giving them a nudge allows you already to separate the objects and then carry on with the identification where they are and moving them about. So. Here's one example. Just turn the volume down. Um, here's another robot that is used in this uh, nuclear domain. Uh, you see this on the left hand side. This is the so called Dexter robot by Veolia Nuclear Solutions. And the photo on the left is actually from the Columbia Science Center in the UK, which is one of the, the leading fusion reactors, the experimental fusion reactors. And you may have heard in the news that there's quite some progress recently to uh, actually come towards commercially viable. Uh, systems to provide nuclear fusion as an energy source, uh, which will eventually hopefully help to sort out also our energy problems. Um, the problem is these are still nuclear environments. There's much less risk than with certain fission reactors, I would say, but uh, you still need to actually have some maintenance in there and you still can't have humans in there. So again, there's a system here of the robot on the left that is actually deployable inside a reactor to do maintenance tasks, to replace different items, to repair uh, environments that really are absolutely inaccessible to any human. And on the right side, we had our we had this version of the robot in our lab here at Lincoln, uh, where we introduced the first bit of autonomy into this system. So before it is a purely teleoperated system, as you may have uh, seen before, right? Where we just have one leader robot and the other one follows exactly in the same way. Um, that means it is quite tiring for operators to do this. They must be super, super careful because the moment they smash this into anywhere in the in the, in the reactor walls, uh, they're going to cause massive damage. So 
what we were trying to do in this little project in collaboration with them was to do the easy the easy tasks that we can easily automate already for them and just rely on the human doing those sort of specific dexterous tasks so we can do some go from a to b in a safe way so execute some of the motions of these robots um, autonomously so that should give you a bit of an idea of the um, nuclear domain i think in many applications also in this one the real uh, opportunities often for human and robots working together um, we call that collaboration because these collaborative robots are often sometimes called cobots um, but of course that is also a particular challenge because it requires us to also understand what these humans may want to do and to find this smooth transition point between human uh, taking full control and the robot taking full control is always one of the big challenges in any of these applications. Right, I'm going to move on. Um, now we go from the North Pole to the lovely outdoors of Rice Home Campus, which is part of uh, the University of Lincoln, where the Lincoln Institute for Agri Food Technology is based. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about our Agri Robotics site. Um, and I'm going to start off just because it links quite well to what we've just seen. We're going to stick to picking. Now we're going to not pick nuclear waste out of glove boxes or out of other sort of heaps. We are turning this upside down. We're looking at heaps, but we're looking at heaps of fruit that are hanging down and we want to pick some of them. Similar problem again. First, we need to solve the problem. Where do we actually want to go? Which one do we want to pick? Which of these fruits, if we think about automating fruit picking, which of these fruits do we eventually want to pick? So there's a decision component to decide, well, we better don't pick a green one. We want the ripe ones. We want the nice ones ending up in our punnets. And also exactly trying to find out where they are. Now, that is still relatively easy. You see that the harder bit comes because there are, again, heaps of obstacles there. They're clumped together quite often. So, um, of course, you may have heard quite a bit of the uh, recent problems that the uh, UK uh, soft fruit industry has, or the horticulture industry in general, the agricultural sector has in general, of finding human labour. So there is a very strong push towards more automation in harvesting. Um, and we see very recently huge progress in that domain, and a lot of the players that are developing the first actually commercial viable uh, fruit picking systems. And I'll give you some example later on. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the parity with the human picker, the dexterity, the speed with which humans operate is yet unmatched. But of course, as it becomes particularly hard to get uh, humans to do these sort of jobs, um, robots become very, very attractive. So these work quite simply. There's a camera down here directly mounted on this head. Uh, they use some simple uh, processing to identify those fruits, localize them. And then this is a system that's been now, whatever, five, six years old. Um, so this is clearly outdated technology when it comes to strawberry picking. Um, but I'm just going to point out one of the kind of big research questions, again, showing like where does this overall challenge link into actual research that could be done? So here, for instance, is one of the uh, works that we've done to specifically address the picking within clusters. Because all of a sudden, it's not just going towards a position. You need to, let's call it, wiggle your way in. You, know, you need to push the other ones aside. So you don't just plan to reach a position. You plan with the obstacles around it. And that is, again, some sort of novel research that has been done within our center. Uh, and there's, again, by separating this out into different components, the trajectory planning in its own right is still a research science that people are working on. So you get some just here of sometimes we often work in a uh, kind of we work in simulation is to begin with because one can model and um, assess algorithms and solutions in that quite well and then we go out into the fields and this is actually in the, the rice home campus strawberry farm that we have down there to try test these things out in reality that said ooh. that said uh as I said, fruit picking itself is pretty much on the horizon. So you see a lot of development happening by a lot of this, uh, different companies. Optinion is a 
is one to mention. Doc 2 is, I've got a photo down there at the bottom. Um, on the top right is the Barry robot. Uh, and they, you see that you have slight differences in how they approach the problem. The arm is slightly different. The way they approach it, the way they have the end manipulator, so how they are taking the fruit off varies. Um, and of course, there's a lot of challenges that come in or a lot of application specific demands that come into the flow here as well, because uh, it has been it's turned out that you want to really minimize the handling of the fruit itself, right? It's easily bruised. So that's why a lot of solutions now go for the stalk to pick it and cut it off and put it in your punnet. And you see on the right side of this opinion, you see also some of the vision components that decide really where do I need to go? How do I need to approach this fruit? Um, you, you get an idea of the speed here. Uh, if I don't have a video of a human doing this job, but they are easily 20 times faster, I would say. So while well, the good thing about robots is we can paralyze, we can have more of them, we could have several arms on one platform, etc. And they, of course, can work for longer hours, uh, reaching the, uh, the same kind of performance as a human is absolutely a, a challenge still for all fruit pickers for all fruit picking robots. Um, I'm going to show you a bit more of automation about some other tasks on the strawberry farm. Picking is one of them, as we will find. And I would argue that it is probably one of the most valuable from, from a grower's perspective, so what they currently are mostly concerned about. If, they, if we would have a strawberry, uh, a competitive strawberry picker, they would be extremely excited about this. But there's many, many other tasks in when it comes in agri-robotics that we can look at. Um, and this is in the context of the so-called robot high-risk projects where we have tried to automate a number of almost the entire uh, process and the entire uh, growth uh, production process for uh, strawberries or on one farm environment. And this is uh, at a farm down in Kent. So I'm going to start up with a quick video where we have done this uh, showcase that was in September. Uh, and you see this is uh, a project led by our uh, beloved partners, Saga Robotics, who built these floorboard platforms that come in all shapes and sizes. So you see one here that is used for UVC treatment. So this shines lights on plants. We have got these that are used for transportation. I'm going to talk about that in a second, a bit more. And I haven't got a video of the, the picking one in here as well, but we have demonstrated that one as part of this event as well. So this is actually going out into the real world from the laps of Lincoln down to an actual farm in Kent and making it work there and automating things like crop monitoring, crop care, crop harvesting, and the logistics of it. So big project, lots of different partners. And because this also means we need to have the right infrastructure in place, we need energy for these robots, we need to have communication infrastructure. That's also how partners like BT, for instance, this project come in. Um, I'm gonna pick one out at the moment, uh, and that is because it follows this line of humans and robots working together. And I've told you that at the moment, the big challenge is that uh, strawberry picking itself is not yet competitive. So one of the things that we wanted to um, look at uh, very early on in this uh, overall uh, project was, can't we automate things that we can already easily automate right now, rather than wait that we can automate the entire uh, picking process. And uh, when you look at these environments and look at the way people operate and are picking fruit at the moment, these humans are going out into the fields. Uh, it's quite a hard job. It's a very skilled job. So really the word low skilled worker does not apply here. Uh, they're really dexterous, super fast operating. Um, and then they need to move these crops when they've picked them off the field from these tunnels and these tunnels most of the strawberries in the uk are grown in these sort of poly tunnels here uh, they can be hundreds of meters long and then they just carry it or push it in a trolley to the end of it and offload it onto a trailer that is pulled by a tractor for instance that's the standard mode of operation now we thought can't we as we have worked so much on making these robots move reliably from a to b in farm environments can't we just use the robots to do the transportation task? Can't we just use them to avoid people having to stop the picking the stuff that they really are good at and just have these robots moving crops about? And that's the, the sort of first system that we came up with 
um, quite a while ago already and that we've been advancing for for quite a while now um, which requires you to conduct fleets of robots because here we are talking about 50 people 50 humans maybe working in the field picking at the same time and we want to support them all by a fleet of robots that comes to them whenever they need it that autonomously charges when it needs more power uh, and automates the entire logistics we call it in field logistics in such a farm environment now how can you do this uh, um, we have combined good old robotics technology good old robotics research because one of the big research questions in mobile robotics is where is my robot robot localization again if you're studying uh, mobile robotics you will learn much more about how we can actually figure out where a robot really is and how we can merge different sensors to do this. Uh, we've taken the same idea. Uh, we have used a uh, Internet of Things small embedded device, a so-called embedded smart trolley system that people put on their trolleys here, pop, um, and it tracks with the position of these trolleys. With that, we know where they are. Uh, this just hooks into the normal existing mobile network or, uh, and it uses a very cheap GPS on board that allows us to identify where this is and constantly talks to the cloud. So we, we call this cloud computing in that sense, talks to a central system that recognizes where all these are and can then direct the robots around these fields. Now, one of the problems is that GPS itself is typically very noisy. So we need to use some uh, robotics software or some uh, you know you can say this is also some some artificial intelligence uh, we call it Bayesian filtering where we integrate many many measurements measurements into a coherent uh, localization for a robot because the GPS itself is only giving you three meter accuracy if you're lucky and the rows are only a meter wide and of course if the robot shoots down the wrong lane shoots on the wrong row 400 meters while the human that needs the robot that has actually something to transport is in the row next door, that wouldn't be any good. So we're combining these long-term measurements and in, in the knowledge about the farm environment, where these different rows are to pin down the exact location of where these robots will be needed, and then they can come around. So you can summon a robot to help. help. And that allows us overall in the in a coordination system where we bring these, uh, where, we, where we conduct all the robots in a fleet. You see this here at the bottom with two robots as an example. There's this so-called topological map, which is, you can clearly make out the rows of strawberries on the right-hand side. This is in our RISOM environment. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have a sort of indoor environment where the robot goes in to drop those strawberries off, actually. So the, the kind of clever bit, the AI bit here is, uh, optimizing the position of these robots in the field and at the same time managing the traffic so that they don't conflict with one another so they don't block each other right so we have got a lot of traffic management to do in this context and then you can uh, call a robot over to to uh, do a transportation task for you or you can actually use through some uh, online a, uh, online interface you can send a robot to do another task so we can send it for instance to go out and count fruits or to actually deliver some treatment or to monitor them. So this is the growers then basically defining the task, what they want these robots to do, and then do it all completely by themselves. So there's not much shared autonomy in there, but of course there's human robot collaboration because we are moving towards a human and solving the task together, automating some bit of the overall picking process. So here's an integrated demo of where we have these different types of robots moving together. So the one on the left is doing a transportation task. The one on the right here is our data gathering system. And we use that data gathering system, which has got a number of cameras uh, to monitor the crops, to uh, count how many ripe fruits we have, how many flowers there are, how many green fruits there are, and bring all this data together that is completely autonomously gathered to then inform decisions for the growers. We, we uh, inform decisions here, they have a much better idea of how much a yield they will get from a specific environment if they get the detailed information about how many crops are currently growing in there, which allows them then to do something like yield forecasting and actually make get engaging better contracts. So that was the sort of nice run over to these fruit counting 
um, aspect. So we have, again, we're coming back to the vision system, right? We are just looking here at strawberries and we're looking at these different crops that we are trying to pick. And we can not only detect them and have the position for them anymore, but we can assess their ripeness, we can assess their size, we can uh, hopefully also identify flowers. And we know how they, in general, kind of they follow a growth model. And if we can use this growth model, we can forecast what you actually will get in about three weeks' time, in about six weeks' time from the current situation. And also, these sort of vision models where robots go out and just collect the data allows us to detect diseases and abnormal development early on. So this is uh, one of these examples where we've got this robot, as you've seen it before, moving over the row, collecting tons of data, but using these so-called deep learned models to detect the ripeness, uh, to identify the ripeness of these strawberries and detect the position, counting them up and feeding that into um, some machine learned models of time series forecasting. Time series forecasting is pretty much the same you're doing uh, for, for uh, any sort of financial uh, forecasting as well, where you're trying to predict the uh, the stock rates for a certain company, for instance, based on some uh, past performance and some current situations uh, that you know that might impact this and you're trying to predict how is it going to develop in the future. So there's a huge area in AI and machine learning about time series forecasting and particular in our agricultural domain uh, people are very much interested in getting better models for that because a typical uh, error rate is something around 20 percent at the moment and that's already considered often to be quite good uh, when it comes to strawberries so this goes into the area of machine learning ai where we try to get huge amounts of data and we've done this over three years now in our strawberry farm here to come back with better learned models uh, that can actually reduce the error rate in our best case for our specific farm environment down to 8%, which is about three weeks forecasting and you only are about 8% of in the total uh, amount of fruits in terms of weight that you actually gain. Good. So for, to make all this works, we've spent many, many years working, particularly with Saga Robotics, to make these robots move autonomously, reliably. Uh, Tons of work to actually also automatically tune those parameters to make them smooth and allows these robots to run now for tens of kilometers every night without any human intervention. And all is around this so-called topological maps, which is now scaled up to huge farm environments. And uh, our uh, colleagues from Saga Robotics are now running these commercial operations uh, of UVC treatment in uh, there we are, uh, in uh, actual farms in the UK and also in California. Uh, the great thing about UVC treatment, so that is shining high intensity ultraviolet light onto the plants during the night time, removes the need for chemical treatment against a disease that's called powdery mildew, which is a fungus. So with that, just using robots to deliver these tasks at nighttime when nobody wants to work really, has completely removed the requirement for a chemical treatment. So it's a massive step change in the way of how uh, farmers are treating their crops or how, uh, caring for them. So the real what was important for that is to make these robots move up and down reliably for these huge amounts of, of areas that need to be treated. Um, there are still, if you have got this shape and form and you've got a reliably working robot, you can also look into um, spraying uh, treatments. Here's one example uh, that is a sprayer that our colleagues have developed there and is also developed in the context of this robot high risk project. Overall, uh, we at Lincoln, we are, we, we threw these competences that we had from the Lincoln Institute for Agri Food Technology and our Center for Autonomous Systems together a couple of years ago to start something new, which is called Lincoln Agri Robotics. It really is one of the biggest centers of excellence in the world to focus specifically on the application of robotics in agriculture. Um, and we have, which is not only in, in strawberries, as you see here, so it's in phenotyping. We see this at the top left where we have got trial plots that are automatically assessed and uh, scouted for diseases and problems. In there we have got uh, also uh, 
robots that are measuring environmental factors that are measuring soil properties. We've got areas of crop care, harvesting, uh, logistics, uh, then these sort of old vision problems that we have looked at before. So can we actually assess the crop status? Can we do some phenotyping? It's a big mission that we put together here. Um, and I invite you to have a bit of a look at what Lincoln Agro Robotics else is doing because I can really just scratch the surface here. Um, last but not least, I wanted to just, uh, if if this excites you, and uh, you may even be doing uh, some robotics already, um, I am quite proud to say that Lincoln, we have now completed the, call it the entire uh, higher education value chain uh, in robotics education, I would say. So uh, we have a new BSc in robotics starting in 2023. So this is going to go, go live and well, we've got the first students already registered now to start in September in 2023. Uh, it's our first really, truly interdisciplinary degree uh, that we have got in the College of Science, where we brought together the schools of engineering, computer science and layered. Uh, and we particularly focus on a project based learning approach, which means. For, right from the start, you actually are. Uh, building systems that are motivated by some real world challenges uh, we embed the whole learning into this sort of project-based learning approach so that's a new one and i've shown you the sort of structure of that new program program on the right hand side we have already have the msc in robotics and autonomous systems that also feeds into our EPSA center for doctoral training uh, which is one of the uk's four robotics center for doctoral training that exists but it's the only one that focuses on a specific domain, uh, okay, food robotics in this case. Can you see some of these impressions there on the top right? Excellent. That is all I wanted to uh, tell you about. It was a quite quick whistle stops tour. Uh, I hope it was somewhat interesting. I'll have to close again with our uh, little helper that we started off with. And I hope you're going to enjoy some lovely holidays.